Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first in this series of uh, webinars aimed at helping you through the process of applying for the Specialized Foundation Program, or uh, what was previously known as the Academic Foundation Program. It had a rebrand uh, last year. We, in short, are three academic doctors. We'll introduce ourselves as things get going. But the point of this series is to provide a free easily accessible, easy to digest, and it's also going to be on demand as well because these sessions are being recorded. Uh, basically, a, a companion guide, a companion series of, of webinars to help you navigate this uh, somewhat murky set of waters when it comes to applying for, for the SFP. Now, the first thing that we have to say uh, we are all employed doctors now, and we have to behave like employed doctor professionals. Is that all the views expressed during this presentation and the series as a whole are solely those of the presenters, that being myself, Aqua, and Alex, and do not reflect those of the NHS nor our employing trusts. But with that standard disclaimer out of the way, um, I will let my erstwhile colleagues introduce themselves very quickly and we'll, <laughs> we'll cover it in more detail. Yeah, so as Ali said, we're just gonna cover who we are initially. We'll talk about what the SFP is, talk about the advantages, any disadvantages, how do you actually apply? We're gonna go into depth in a little bit about the academic units, stats, then, you know, white space questions. I'll let Alex introduce himself. Hi everyone, my name's Alex. Um, was a final year medical student just a few weeks ago. Studied at UCL, um, now working as a FY1 doctor at the Royal Free NHS Foundation Trust. My academic unit is UCL, so I'm staying at the same trust as I trained at. And my year one rotations this year are general surgery, psychiatry and geriatrics. In year two, I'll be doing urology, academic nuclear medicine and radiology and um, A&E. Career aspirations for myself for academic urology. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's odd, isn't it, seeing your face in one of these things? Uh, so my name is Ollie. I trained at the University of Warwick, uh, which is down just outside Coventry, for those of you unfamiliar. The hospital I'm based at has really two large tertiary centres, the Royal Victoria Infirmary and the Freeman Hospital our big regional transplant centre. The academic unit to which I'm affiliated is Newcastle University, who they handle the academic bit of my contract. I completed FY1 jobs in HPB and transplant surgery, so that's mostly gallbladders, pancreases, and that kind of thing. Uh, I then had an academic rotation in F1, which is fairly unusual, and finished up on acute internal medicine with a splash of clinical pharmacology and toxicology. I'm now into my foundation two uh, year and I'm currently working in neurology, staring down my next academic rotation and I will then finish in psychiatry. I'm mainly interested in neurosurgery and currently exploring uh, possibilities of neurointerventional radiology. And that leaves me with me. I went to Leicester and I'm currently based at Royal Sun um, for two years and it's a weird mix of it's um, pretty much like a district general for anything medicine but for some reason it's a tertiary centre for surgical stuff which is ideal for me because I want to be a surgeon. My academic unit, because my uh, academic programme is actually kind of not attached, I can do whatever I want. I have affiliations with UCL and I will be with University of Surrey and because I am also working with Newcastle, I've put that down as my academic unit. For my FY1, I'm currently on general surgery and I've cried at least five times uh, yesterday alone. Then I'll be moving on to stroke rehab, which is a very, very chill rotation, then finish on emergency before going on to my FY2, where I hope to do my academic block. Then Oddly, again, academic endocrinology, where it's not typical to have back-to-back -back academic stuff, um, where I'll still be seeing patients, but the vast majority is doing research focusing on endocrinology. And then um, I will hope to get urology if the last person agrees to swap. Um, and yes, similar to Alex, I want to be an academic urologist. But 
I'll hand it to Alex now. All right, I will briefly cover the first half of this session on an overview of the SFP programme. So the SFP programme is essentially a rebrand of what was formerly known as the Academic Foundation programme. I think the name uh, is kind of a, a change to appreciate that there is more to just academic research um, in the Foundation programme, as we'll touch upon in a bit. It's on an alternative application pathway to the standard Foundation pathway. Um, and it's usually one in six of your rotations are now a different block. Um, and as we'll mention now, these can include research, medical education, and leadership and management. It's important to remember that whilst one of these rotations are could be research, for instance, you are still a clinician five out of six um, of that time. So it's not to forget that you're still a doctor working in the hospital. So you might be wondering, why should I apply? Well, there are many reasons that you should, one of them being that you now have dedicated time to pursue your interests. So if it was research, for instance, imagine the amount of spare time you had to put in to achieve a publication in med school. This was on top of, you know, your daily lectures, um, attending hospital placements and having to do that in your spare time. Essentially, the SFP now gives you a four month block uh, dedicated to this and you can do as much as you want. This will give you dedicated time again to develop your own portfolio and really to explore whether an academic career is for you. And that's what it's really designed for. And we'll touch upon this in a minute. The main benefit is you get your offer two months earlier than everyone else. You get your offer in January, whereas most people get this in March. So you already know where you are going. And when you get the offer, the SJT automatically is weighed less. You just need to achieve a satisfactory score. And as mentioned, one of your six rotations will be a break from clinical medicine, allowing you to pursue your own interests and research and so on. Here is a overview of the integrated acad academic training pathway. That's quite important to understand for the program. The AFP or SFP is essentially the starting block in the academic pathway. Some of you may have done an IBSC, MD, PhD, or even an MSc. And now it's the real time to have a dedicated pathway whilst being a doctor to see whether a academic career is for you. The aim of this is if it is for you, then ideally you'd be interested in pursuing this further. Maybe you'd apply for an ACF, further down the line doing a PhD, ACL, and you know, looking at the longer um, scope, would you be looking towards a professorship in the future as well? But also if you decide that after the SFP, it's not for you, you can go back to standard clinical training and you've lost nothing. There are a few disadvantages to applying. Um, the first being that there's extra stress in your final year to apply. Not only do you have to tackle the application, but you've also got to prepare your application, prepare for interviews. You might not know what you want to do. So whilst there are 100 plus jobs in London, you might not necessarily know which one you want to be applying for and spending four months um, you know, really dedicated to that. There is a greater expectation that you're clinically competent because you have one fewer clinical rotation. And that's essentially why all the programs test your clinical competency through a clinical um, interview. You also have one few rotation to choose a specialty. So foundation program is a great opportunity for you to get a flavor of different specialties and to see what you'd like to apply for later on. So now you have one few opportunity to do that. So it's important to keep that in mind. This sounds great. Now, how do you apply to the specialized foundation program? This is run parallel to the foundation program. So as your deadline's looming on the 21st of September, you'll be um, doing this alongside the standard foundation program. You're allowed to apply to up to two AUAs, essentially um, very similar to foundation program deaneries. And we'll touch upon this in a bit. The general structure is that there is some form of long listing, short listing, an interview and an offer. Historically, certain places use deciles, and this is not always used anymore. So historically, London used to have a decile cutoff for long listing. This has now been removed and replaced with short listing. Short listing typically um, is made up of your portfolio and sometimes white space questions. Um, you proceed to an interview and an offer. And if you receive an offer in January, you only have 48 hours to sit on this, decide and to either accept or decline it. So there is an urgency to this as well. 
once you accept an SFP offer, you are withdrawn from all other foundation applications. So if you apply to the standard foundation, foundation priority programs, you are automatically withdrawn from those and you now have a job as an SFP doctor. You are, however, still required to sit the SJT and PSA later on. For the SJT, this no longer feeds in like the foundation um, program as a score to your EPM, um, but you just need to get a satisfactory score. So this relieves a lot of burden. And most importantly, remember, you lose nothing by applying for it. So if you don't get it, you don't get it, and it doesn't affect your foundation um, program application. We've done the best we can to find every link to all of the um, academic units of applications for you. And here are a sample of the QR codes to easily access the pages. Uh, finding information for these um, AUAs can be difficult. So we, we recommend taking a picture of this if you can. One thing that's uh, important to note is that from last year, uh, there was a deanery called LAX, and that was essentially London, Kent, Surrey, and Sussex. That is now split into two. London is its own foundation school and KSS and Wessex have now merged to form another foundation school. So there are approximately around 15 uh, AUAs in total that you can apply to. It's important to look up each one because not, all, uh, not only are there a different number of jobs for each one, but the types of jobs they offer are different too. Just a rough overview of statistics so you have a greater understanding of you know, how popular this is. This is from the 2020 Recruitment Stats and Facts Report. We weren't able to find any later or more up-to-date information. In the year 2020, about a quarter um, of all applicants in final year applied. That's roughly about 8,000 final year students. Um, about 2,500 applied and 1,700 submitted because not everyone will uh, complete the applications. Remember that you're allowed to apply to up to two um, foundation schools and about half apply for one and half apply for two. This looks a bit uh, scary to look at initially, but it's just a rough overview of the applications made by medical school um, and how many on the right apply to their local academic unit. So you have a greater understanding of, you know, in your medical school, how popular is the AFP? and say you went to UCL and like to stay at UCL, how many of your peers would also be doing that too? Here is a table showing the um, fill rates for the SFP. It's a very popular program, as mentioned, about a quarter of all um, final year students will be applying. And every year, all jobs are essentially filled. Um, the first table shows the way the offers are made so on, on a certain date in January, first cascade of offers are made. If these offers are accepted, they're withdrawn. If they're declined, they're, they're offered to the next scoring candidates. And so there are a few can, um, cascades before they're all mopped up at the end, essentially. And they are nearly always filled. And below is just showing the fill rates for, for each academic unit of application. Thanks, Aqua. Yep, again, just showing the same thing. So how can you prepare? First thing is to attend our series. We've designed an eight part series over two months, every Thursday, covering essentially what's below. The best things you can do are to prepare your white space questions if they apply to you, preparing your portfolio that's due on Oriel in the next couple of weeks. And the most important things are to prepare for the academic and clinical interviews. They're two separate styles of interviews and there are two um, different methods that you need to to essentially prepare for each one um, and ultimately fingers crossed you'll get your SFP offer hand over to Ollie and Aqua now okay cool thank you Alex um it's a really good uh tour through I think so I'm going to be talking a bit about the white space questions now and I'm, I'm going to invite Aqua to to chip in and interrupt me whenever she, she wants to give some wisdom. Um, but we're going to talk about the white space questions now, which which is probably the reason that most of you are here. Uh, so what is a white space question? The best place to start is to know your enemy always. So a white space question is essentially a miniature personal statement. But unlike your medical school personal statement, someone is going to read what you write for your 
<laughs> SFP uh, personal statements. It's a very brief, summarized way of learning more about a particular candidate. Crucially, what it allows you to do is it's, it's a form of qualitative information, something that would be difficult to capture in something like the SJT or a typical multi-choice exam or some other easier means of gathering data about a person. You know, right from the offset, just from the fact that white space questions are used and the fact that they are more labor intensive and time intensive than lots of other things that academic units of application could choose to do, that tells us that they're quite important, otherwise they wouldn't do them. But we also have to remember that each academic unit of application uses them differently. And the best advice that I think we can give is you have to make the assumption that your entire score may be based on your white space questions unless you have specifically been told otherwise. Essentially, we don't know how each deanery may or may not use them unless they tell you. And so all I'm trying to say is do a good job and make sure that you put proper planning and forethought into them. Um, because like I say, as far as we know, it might be the basis of your entire application. Yeah, like I know from listening to myths and legends that there are some deaneries that if they want to, they could very much absolutely scrap any papers, scrap any projects and, fo and fully focus on your white space. And they can do that whenever they want. So make sure that you really work on them. Yeah. yeah. Whoops. Do you want to go through these, Aqua? Sure. So talk about some of my bugbears and some introductory tips. Um, I feel like having reviewed some white space questions, this is quite important. And I feel like a lot of people are not really answering the question that they're asked, that they're being asked. So you'll see in like leadership answers, they're giving teamwork. And then in teamwork answers, they're giving in, they're giving leadership stuff. Obviously make an effort. And if something's not, un if something's not related, don't try to force it or cram it into it because there most likely will be space for you to put it into another question. And yes, there should always be some sort of narrative. Everybody, when you're reading through a white space question, people intuitively want to look for a little story. So if, if it can flow, that's good writing. Point, evidence, explain. And yes, um, I think this was key for, I think, Ollie and I. I think we sent our white space questions to at least what, at least like five people. Um, the be the more eyes, the better. But obviously when it comes to a certain saturation point, eh, it might spoil the broth. But initially, try to get, you know, in its first stages, and I'm sure a lot of you have already done that, um, get it sent to as many people as you can. And yes, be honest, but then something that ha I've also noticed with you know the white space questions that I've reviewed so far is you can be honest whilst not being overly polite you don't have to be like it would be an honor to gain this or um if accepted onto this like go for it literally just th that those are wastes you know you're wasting words um you would relish the opportunity. Just just say that you would do this if you were given the SFP, you know? Um, don't put yourself down. Be honest, but then uh, you can oversell yourself. Yes, you can be a bit confident, but this is the best time to, to do that. Ollie, do you want to add anything to that or? Not really about the, the golden. I think being, it's the same advice that I give people who are, who are applying to medical school when they're writing their personal statements and when they're going for interview, it's, it's much easier to, to simply be honest than it is to try and second guess what an interviewer might be looking for at all times. It's, it's just not worth it, to be honest. Like The best way to do it is to go in, be honest with your answers, and when you're writing these answers, because that's also, not only is it the easiest way to approach something like this, is to tell your story, but it also means that you're more likely to match to a program that is right for you. 
you know, that really is the optimal scenario that you are honest in your answers and that lands well with the person assessing your application and then you get the job because you're a good match for the program and no waffling because indeed waffles are for breakfast not for your specialized foundation program application yeah like if you've already said one thing in a one answer you pretty much don't need to copy and paste it and if you can do something in one sentence but you've written two just cut 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 because if anything yes they will read it but try to be as concise as you can i'm handing over to you ollie okay cool so this is just what we're going to call a basic plan of attack here so these are principles that you should aim to be adhering to at all times and this is not just actually for your white space questions but for your interview for you know a clinical scenario these are, these are good skills just to get down but they're very important at this early stage so point evidence explain this is how i was taught to write in like year four or whatever <laughs> in uh in school and it's it's stuck ever since and it, it's because it's a really good thing to do it should form the backbone of any writing you do we're trying to capture not just events not just the things that happen if i told you about the events that happened to me today they wouldn't be very interesting but what makes them a story a story has to have a beginning a middle and an end um maybe with a twist in there if that's what you like it's about capturing the event trying to explain what you have learned and any outputs that you got from it. So it's quite important to try and capture through this process that you have some sort of plan or some vague orientation as to where you might want your life to go. A 10 year plan is often the easiest way to start. If that's too hard, try a five year plan. What is it that you actually want from life? You know, do you want to be a doctor do you want to be a surgeon do you want to not be a doctor do you want to be a researcher do you want to write nice guidelines do you want to teach medical students do you want to be a lecturer do you want to work in medical politics or the medico legal world you know you could be doing human rights stuff that there's just so much you can do um and just having some vague ideas of what interests you is a good place to start So what we're going to do and how we're going to approach the next 20 minutes, half an hour or so, is we're going to look at some examples of questions first. And these are from the 2023 uh, SFP application uh, documents, you know, the same documents that you all have been sent. So the first thing we're going to do is dissect some questions. And then in a few slides, we're going to talk about how we're going to try and approach them. OK, so. Please outline your previous research experience and achievements. It's used the word outline there, which is actually an unusual word to put in a sentence. Um, you don't see it used in this way very often. And it can be helpful to try and think about what that means and what an outline is as a summary of the evidence available on a particular topic given in some sort of chronological order with a clear relationship between the ideas and the concepts that we're talking about. So here is an example of something that I drafted and put together. This isn't from my answer. This is just a, a thing that we might see um, submitted. And what I'd really like you to do and what I'd really appreciate is if in the chat bar, this is where we're really going to use it, is tell me something that you think about this this isn't intended to be perfect it's just an example of something that someone might write so during a student selected module i designed and led research into risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea which resulted in a local oral presentation a research prize from my medical school i drafted the protocol gathered survey data and performed statistical analysis and the manuscript has since been accepted for publication in annals of medicine and surgery and just as an exercise, uh, because I know that Alex and Aqua haven't seen this before, 
just as I want you guys to to put in the chat what you think, I'd I'd invite Aqua and Alex to see what they think about this because this will be brand new to them. So uh, before we answer, um, we can let our amazing viewers answer too. So far, mm -hmm. we have from Charlotte. It demonstrates previous experience, but it doesn't link back to the SFP. And Emma, um, I'm not going to attempt to say your last name. Emma has said that it seems to be quite a little bit of repetition in the last sentence. Should I chip in to what I think this is? I think, oh yeah, Ibrahim says it could be written more succinctly, definitely. And I think, I'm not sure if Alex, you're going to say this or if one of our amazing viewers is going to say this, but this isn't really outlining. This is describing, if you will. Alex? Completely agree with you, Aqua. Um, I think this person's had a very, very productive SSC module and obviously achieved a lot here. It's good to see, you know, all the achievements they've, they've received, you know, first prize, um, presentation, oral presentation, even the publication. That's, that's really good to see. Um, obviously, it depends on the word limits, if there is one. Um, but it'd be also nice to see if you could expand a bit more uh, on various factors here, uh, including maybe potentially, you know, what you learned from it as well, not just stating what you've done and what you've achieved. And Hugo has said, it seems to mention only one project. Could they have included other experiences? And yeah, I think this is um, this allows me to mention what I wrote for this question. Essentially, what I did was little bullet points of the different methodologies that I've done, the output, you know, because it says outline, which means technically we can list because we have a separate question talking about and asking about our single best achievement. And that's where this possibly could have gone into if it was more concise and if they spoke about what they could have, you know, brought to the SFP as well. Yeah, so again, like I say, this this is intended and there are other answers like this during this presentation. It's the way that I want you to think about it, if you're viewing the talk tonight, is these are not good or bad examples. They are just examples. And the thing that will help and help you draft your own answers is by you analyzing what they what well, what I've written, but what this hypothetical person has written and what they do well and what they do badly. And you can try and emulate what they do well and stay away from what they do badly. So in this paragraph, um, lots of you have, have identified the right things. This person has said they, they have described what they've done, which is a, a good place to start. They've described their outputs. They got some presentations. They got a prize. They got a paper. They've done, as Alex says, clearly very well in a short space of time. They have also said which parts of the process they were involved with as well, which is a great thing to do. Um, but Aqua there has mentioned her approach, which was talking about the different methodologies that she has worked with, which, you know, you couldn't get a better example of research experience, could you? Because that's that's really what it has to be about. You're showing how valuable a researcher you could be in their institution. Um, We'll move on to the next example. So again, this is a, a second question that is given in this year's specification. So it's please describe your previous relevant teaching experience and achievements as a teacher within and outside medicine. So during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, many students contacted me to say they were not getting clinical skills experience. I designed and organized a weekly teaching program for clinical students practicing their online OSCEs. I received excellent feedback and my work was commended by my medical school. So just as we did before, I'd, I'd invite you to, to write what you think in the chat, because this is a workshop. After all, it's, it's not us telling you what to write. This is um, bi-directional. And uh, then once you've had some time to digest it, I'll, I'll ask Akwa and Alex to to give their thoughts. Before 
we let our viewers digest this. Um, Charlene has asked, how many experiences would you discuss to avoid just listing and not reflecting? Or do you think it should just be a list for this outline, for you know the previous outline question? So I, unfortunately, Charlene, I'm thinking that in every other space, in every other question, I've had, I've, I've, I put decent amount of reflection. I put my aspirations. I gave them a good understanding of who I want to be, um, if that makes sense. And I really use that as more for I did this, I did that, list, list, list. But that's just my take. I, I would agree with that. I think outline is probably more to if it's on a spectrum between listing and reflecting it probably is more towards that listing um, end of things. I, I don't know, before we jump into this second example, whether Alex, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a fine balance, really. Um, I think the, the one thing to bear in mind for white space questions is it's all very subjective. It's not like the portfolio where everything has a score, everything is, you know, assigned a... a uh, a value. So here, you know, someone might think it's a perfect answer, but someone reading it might think it's completely wrong. So I think it's really up to you and what you think is appropriate. And um, I think it's a balance between simply listing and maybe expanding a bit too, because whilst it's useful to know you, you led a international project, really, I know what it involved, you've listed it to me, but most important, what did you learn from it? How will that, you know, um, affects how you do things moving forward so a bit of reflection is useful but obviously it's a balance between spectrum no exactly so i think i ended it with how i could benefit the sfp or how i could benefit or use my existing skills but um we've got tons and tons of responses for the second example ollie great so, so let's have a look so charlotte at 803 was the first yeah. one Great. So Charlotte said it shows relevant experience and it doesn't reflect on, on what went well or what they could do better. Yeah, I completely agree. You're right. There is there is no reflection whatsoever, is there? There is there is an acknowledgement that things seem to have gone well. They've presented some evidence, which is the excellent feedback that that is, I suppose, something. And they've received this commendation by the medical school, which is, again, a form of output or evidence but they haven't really told us why or what they're going to do differently or what, or even what they think <laughs> went well. Um, what else have we got? Sarah said, doesn't mention what they taught. Yeah, again, correct. They, they haven't said really what they've actually done. They've, they've said that they organized something, um, but you're right, not much detail on what they've done. A uh, bit of a waffle, yeah, during the height of the pandemic, that's fair. It's quite poetic, flowery language, isn't it? It is, and it's like, okay, but that's everyone. Like, you could have just cut all of that, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, Emma. Patrick, you want to take, yeah, Emma's? Yeah, Emma says, it comes across really well, but I'm left wondering why students were contacting the person about their lack of experience in the first yeah. place. <laughs> Did they take on a student rep role of some kind? Yeah, very true. I didn't even think about that, to be fair. Yeah. Why did they, why did students go to this person? Yeah, um, there's no context provided, is no. there, for, for why this happened? Yeah, and Said has said, oh, hi, Said. They've said um, they've not included examples of feedback, like quotes. This is kind of just like he said, she said rather yeah. than any proof or measure. Yeah, I, I, I really agree, actually. A, a quote in the context of what you're trying to sell here could be a really powerful tool, um, actually. And I would maintain that and take that forward for some of the questions that talk about your single best achievements um, or when you're trying to show how superlatively good something is part of your evidence could very well be a quote and something something like that would be a very good device to use. Alex, do you have anything to add? Completely agree with what you've both said so far. Um, I think when we compare here the describe to outline, I think it, I think most people would agree describe needs a bit more description as opposed to simply outlining and listing your achievements. So here it's very 
a cold answer listing what they've done well it definitely needs a, a bit more of a, a reflection and kind of what they've learned from it as well yeah and charlene has said true uh doesn't discuss anything teaching outside of medicine yeah that's really good and i suppose something to remember before we move on is that not everything that you will be asked to do or asked to describe in the course of your all of your white space questions not everything will apply to everyone and that's one of the great challenges you know if somebody asked earlier about how many experiences or achievements or things should i list well if you've only been involved in one research project then you've got to you've got to really make sure that you hammer home everything you've done haven't you in that one research project and and every drop of value you can get out of it um it may well be that someone in this case doesn't have any teaching experience outside medicine i suspect they probably do i think that most people do just passively you can be quite loose with what the definition of teaching means you know you could be teaching a musical instrument you could be a dance instructor you could be doing um teaching first aid or any you know any number of things that you might do um you is it fair to say guys you can kind of interpret them to flexibly yeah definitely because you're still using your teaching experiences and, and skills it doesn't matter what you're teaching yeah. I definitely agree, especially here it says outside medicine as well, so they've literally opened the book for you. Yeah, they're almost encouraging you really to, to do that, aren't they, to be a bit liberal. Okay, one, one final example of these, I think, and then we're moving on to an actual uh, strategy. Okay, so this third question is, what steps would you take to optimize the benefit of a special experience foundation post from the start of your training? What challenges do you foresee with working both clinically and academically? This is two questions slammed into one, isn't it? But crucially, it it uses the word you multiple times. This is you, your. What challenges do you foresee? What steps are you going to take? Optimize the benefit from your training. It's about what you're going to do um so it's it's not the question here is not what could a candidate do to maximize their experience of a specialized foundation program it's what are you going to do with you know to to maximize the benefit of the special foundation program that you are applying for not the general candidate you so your answer should reflect the academic units that you are applying for it's not a general question it's what are you going to do if we give you the job um consider how you will manage the clinical and academic commitments remembering what we said that you are five six the doctor and one six an academic um you are expected to be as good as your standard foundation colleagues despite having less clinical time as alex has already said um and i think the best way to go about this is setting some smart goals things that are achievable measurable and things that will actually work to help you maintain those standards and this is something that you will actually be asked to do you know aqua and alex i'm sure you'll have had your meetings with your supervisors now um when you've started working as doctors and you have to say look boss this is exactly how i'm going to meet what is expected of me and you have to you have to write it um no exactly like meeting my educational supervisor which you know you guys will do next year um he pretty so i had like some rough goals that i wanted and he completely rewrote it he was like nope we're scrapping that we're doing smart goals because i want you to be like okay in three months time you've achieved this you've achieved that you've done that you need measurable output and i was like oh okay very prescriptive, if you will. And yes, um, with this question, what's a benefit that you would be seeking to gain as well? Very important. And that seems quite a lot to fit into um, what 
200 words now, I think your limit is. Um, this is a really chunky question, and I've also um, added my interpretation of it nearer to the end, um, just so you guys keep, um, you know, when you have the slides or when you're reviewing this webinar afterwards again for your practice, you can see both mine and Ollie's interpretation of this to help you out if you're stuck on this or if you've not included something. Back to cool. Ollie. Yeah, so, so now these... We're, we're going to go through this next section quite quickly, the next two or three slides, but I think this is the best form of concise advice that you can give to someone in the position that you guys are in. Um, so these are just some linguistic devices, some helpful mnemonics to help you write. So the camp structure is one that is mentioned in every business interview book that has ever been written, since, well, since about 2000. Um, the camp structure, clinical, academic, managerial, and personal. These are four large domains that exist within your career. So clinical is obvious, we're doctors, um, that is what we do. We treat, we diagnose, we manage. Um, academic, again, I think most of us understand what that means. That's research, that's continuing professional development, that's learning, that's education. Um, managerial is then more about leadership and organization um you know you might say i want to uh alongside being a researcher you know say uh aqua or alex wants to be an academic urologist for reasons that are best known to themselves and they decide to you know do all of this high profile nihr funded work in a urology lab but they might say i want to head up my own lab and i want to do a big clinical trial that changes clinical practice. And that's much more managerial in nature, isn't it? Think about the skills that it takes to do something like that. Um, or you want to start a business, or you want to um, be, be the next clinical leader. And then personal is exactly what it sounds like. It's, I want to be in this particular city um, because I really like the city, or I want to be close to where my family is, or I want a life plan, a career, and I want to work less than full time, so it gives me more time to spend with my family, or to work on another pursuit, um, you know, outside my clinical job. There's lots of little avenues to everyone's lives, and I think it's okay to to be really honest and upfront and say, this is what I want and this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah. And um, I think personal, what, what did I include in my personal stuff? Oh yeah. I spoke. So excuse me. Like we all have reasons for wanting to pursue whatever we want to pursue. Mr. Brain. I don't understand why you like the brain, but it is what it is. So in my, uh, obviously I'm very pro and into men's health. And that was my personal interest. And that is when I used the the camp, um, I guess, mnemonic. When I expanded on what really draws me to urology. And that was probably my little personal link. Because remember, you're very tight for words. And yes, we've looked at Anna's um, question. And it's about lab-based projects. Yes, I'm sure they exist. And um, I'm sure Oxford and Cambridge, for example, I know they have them. In my deanery, the HBB um and urology actually they're looking at um cancer cells in the lab so it's very much possible and if anything there's nothing preventing you from once you once you've entered your post you can just even if it's not connected to your academic stream or program but you're interested say for example you landed a breast academic job but you're actually interested in gyne there's nothing stopping you from approaching the gyne um, people and saying hey i'm an academic xyz are there any um, opportunities for me to get involved in this? Nothing, absolutely. And you having that academic title actually helps because they're like, right, okay, they they already understand. It's, it's that kind of like golden ticket, if you will. Yeah. And not to mention the dedicated time you have to do what you what you really want to do. So that's the real benefit of the SFP. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, my my first meeting with my academic supervisor was quite literally right ollie you've got four months what do you want your job plan to be 
Like, what do you want to do? Because you're being paid for four months, basically, regardless of what you do. So what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to do, you know, one day a week working on this project, one day a week working on this different project, maybe one day a week teaching, one day for uh, skills development. So that's been attending lectures in things like statistics or data management at the university. And then one day a week flexible to to put into any of the projects as required. And they were like, yep, yeah, cool. That's your job now. So with the right supervisor, there really can be ultimate flexibility. This is something that um, Alex already spoke about briefly when it came to the um, academic pathway. But the reason why we've put it here again is because it's absolutely vital for you um, for the first question, I think, is asking about your motivations and why you want to apply. Some of you that I've read have not mentioned your, as Ollie said, your short and long term clinical and academic goals. That is where you absolutely need to mention that you want to embark on the first step of the integrated academic clinical pathway, because I fore foresee myself being this, this, this. Because as we've all three of us have said multiple times, you are five, six, a clinician. So even if you don't want to do medicine right now, unfortunately, at least for two years, you are contracted to do medicine. That's very important for you to understand. Whilst you might want to be a CTF, and that is what you've thought about in the past like two to three years because you're interested in med ed, you need to stretch yourself and think about where you want to be in five to 10 years, because that is what will get you the, the cookies, the marks, if you will. Yeah. Even if it's not true. Exactly. Even if it's not true, genuinely, like I remember when I was talking to one of my friends like last year, he was on the fence of being interested in cardiology or respiratory, but he tried linking it to what his existing research was. And I think he did some amazing uh, like air pollution stuff. And I was like, bro, what the heck? Use rest, go rest. That is perfect for rest. And then link in COVID and boom, we've got the best motivational like answer ever. You need to use your strengths. Uh, yeah, even, even if it's not 100% true, just, just, you know, extend the truth a bit. <laughs> well, all, all, I, all I really mean is you're not beholden to what you say in your academic interview. You know, you might say, as I did in, in my interview, I am, I'm going to do this. I'm going to 100% be an academic neurosurgeon in 10 years and I still won't have CCT'd and I still won't have a consultant job because there aren't any consultant jobs. But that's kind of, you're, you're not backing yourself into a corner. You're just showing awareness that, that this is the long-term progression and you're exploring your academic career. So if we move on to the next slide, this is one of the really helpful structures again, that's gonna help us uh, demonstrate our competencies um in terms of achieving our goals so this um the reason we put these two things together like i said the star structure which is what's on the right hand side this is about demonstrating competencies if someone asks you tell me about a time you did x or describe an experience where you did x or tell me about a time when you worked in a team or any of these things all of these things come into context or come under the context of your long-term goal, remember? So it's what I did in the past, situation, task, action, result, reflection. This is how I'm taking things forward. I'm going to use them to learn on the specialized foundation program in post and how it forms part of my career. So situation there is the thing that happened. I, you know, I was at a cardiac arrest or something. Task was uh, I had to put in an airway under pressure. And action was I put in the airway. I did what the anaesthetist told me. I put it in correctly, despite being under immense pressure. We had somebody that, that had arrested. Um, the result might even be that, that we lost the patient. You know, the patient had maybe got better or or they didn't. 
but on reflection i worked as part of a team in an incredibly high stress environment like the most high stress environment really and it showed me that i can do my clinical skills under pressure and communicate well as part of a team and follow orders you know there's so much you can take from even fairly simple experiences so this structure is something that can be really helpful and then as we move on we've just got uh we've got three final dissections which we're only going to spend about a minute on each of some of the the found the specialized foundation questions and this is how we would encourage you to think about the questions all of them involve reading them very carefully but give one example of a non-academic achievement and its significance to your application for a special experience program one example it's right there in the question <laughs> this comes back to what we we're saying about the difference between listing and reflecting if it asks you for one thing lots of description lots of reflecting non-academic as well interesting a bit liberal again because you need to think about what you actually mean by academic but this can be anything from sports music hobby a society that you're part of volunteering something not to do with your schoolwork basically and its significance to your application you are applying for a job this is a job interview um how does it fit into your your camp structured plans that we talked about before so then if we go to the next one so this next one sorry everything's lagging a bit for me but give one example in which you've demonstrated your leadership abilities this example should be from your undergraduate or postgraduate experience if relevant which i think is a really unhelpful <laughs> clause to put in a question at some point in your life give me an example uh, it should identify your specific role and contribution as a leader now there's so much that we can dig into here but again one example one not more leadership abilities you've got to think about what that actually means so what does a leader do it's about communication inspiring delegating and coordinating really a good leader shouldn't do anything if you think about what happens in something like a cardiac arrest the person leading is the one stood at the end of the bed the end of the bed even commanding and delegating identifying your specific role and that is your cue to say in this situation i did xyz not we did not the team did what the team did is important but it's asking about your role and your contribution as a leader and again you have to conceptualize and think about what a leader actually is and what the point of a good leader is and then one final example uh, that we have on the next slide <laughs> yes there we go the transitions are taking like 10 seconds on my screen um, please describe your experience in simulation training and the value of development of simulation training for doctors so your experience in simulation training we will all at some point in our medical school education have some form of experience with simulation remembering that it is not just being in a clinical skills lab and being surrounded by by monitors and screens and things taking blood from a dummy is a simulated skill um it's anything where you're practicing practicing an oski with your friends on a teddy bear or something that is a simulation um so it's again being clear and it's describing your experience so what did you think about it what went well what went badly what would you have done differently um it talks about the value of simulation and the value of development of simulation so it's basically asking why do we do it what's the point why has it been adopted by many medical schools and it asks specifically for doctors it doesn't say high performance professions so it could say uh vets lawyers pilots um 
you know captains of boats and situations where you you constantly have to perform well it says doctors so why is the value of simulation different for doctors so all i'm trying to get across is dissect the question and think about every single word because every single word is important it's there for a reason so then i think we'll move on to some final tips oh no no remember i wanted to talk about my about how i interpreted this question you did Mr. you're right sorry dr burton how, how <laughs> have you yeah s-h-o-s-h-o um but yes so as well as all these tips i wanted to mention um that this question it was you know there's so much to unpack with this one um but the way i interpreted this was how will you make the most out of your four month block or if you apply to more than eight months um off you know your dedicated time off or to yourself what would you do to hit the ground running as soon as you start and this you know some of the cliche answers that everybody will have will be you'll be approaching your supervisors early you'll be putting in grant applications early you'll be looking at writing your protocol or gaining ethical approval these are buzzwords that you absolutely need to include um because that's how you, that's what they're looking for in that answer and then in terms of challenges do not bash clinicians and don't bash academics i've read a couple of examples where i think somebody said that they that they believed that doctors who did research were better doctors and do not ever you know say that because that's clearly not true the best clinicians i know are full-time clinicians yes they might Obviously, they have to know recent evidence, um, evidence-based trials, but that's not necessarily the case. And if anything, I am very much aware that some researchers are actually less clinically competent. So make sure you don't mention that. Here, you need to holistically mention that you're just getting less time, but you're going to make the most of it by staying on top of your Horus portfolio, meeting your educational and academic supervisor, just these buzzwords that you need to think about as you are one block down from your usual. And again, these slides, um, the recording will be available for you to watch afterwards, just whilst you're um, perfecting your um, academic questions. And yes, I think before we go into our Q&A, double check your white space question requirements based on your academic unit of applications. And this is actually happening in real time be cautious of omitting any mandatory questions um, because some deaneries or academic units might say don't you don't need this when in actuality it's because Oriel is already covering for the mandatory questions so you don't exactly know you know because Oriel is saying and UKFPO is saying this is absolutely mandatory for all no matter what you're doing you know so just be be cautious and if anything reach out um, to the unit of application and just get clarification as soon as possible because I know that's what Ollie did. He literally just reached out to Prof Barnes, who is the lead for the academic unit in Newcastle, who was also his supervisor, not broken at all, by the way. Anyway, um, but yeah, just reaching out to whoever's in charge and just clarifying that's the most important thing. Yeah, they're, they're there to support you. The the, the point of all of these processes is not to eliminate candidates and not to not to cut people down. The point is they want the best candidates. And in order to get the best candidates, they have to give everyone the opportunity to be the best version of themselves that they can be and then choose from all of those people because that's the best way to hire people. Um, and I think that brings us in to a Q&A. Yes. And whilst we, before we go into the Q&A, please, 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 could you fill out um, feedback for us? Thank you so much for attending. Um, but we're very, very keen as this is a workshop for us to answer any questions that you may have. It doesn't necessarily have to be about white space, can be anything to do with the SFB or application itself. But please, please, please do feedback. Yeah. Hi, sorry if this has already been covered from Ibrahim. Do you have any pointers on how to approach the question? Please explain the rationale for your choice of programs. Alec? Maybe it's worth us just maybe discussing how we ended up with our programs. Like what what um, 
factors did we consider? So, you know, um, and if we go back to the the, the camp structure, um, so for me, clinically, I want to do urology. So for me, it was looking at the list of London SFP jobs. Only three programs have a urology job. So that, that narrows it no, down. No, it was four. Is it? Four. Yes. Okay, three or four. Um, academic, I want to do academic urology, but in London, there's no academic urology program. So I looked at, you know, what what's the closest thing that I can do to match my research interests. And for me, that's uh, nuclear medicine and radiology. And if I can focus that towards a urological side, that's a win-win situation. Uh, in terms of management, um, you know, I, I don't think there was any factors for me there, really. Um, anything that uh, anything that's quite flexible here allows you to do really anything you want, if it's teaching medical students, etc. And personal, well, I live in London. I trained at UCL. Um, staying locally was great benefit to me. Uh, so for me, that's ultimately how I filtered out and ended up with the job I really wanted to apply for. Yeah, and if I go next, um, I'm, you know, I went for the same deanery that Alex did because I thought that my portfolio was stronger in terms of what they were looking for, like, you know, like publications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was where my, that's where my strengths were. Um, but for me, yes, research is very, very important, but I know that I'm going to continue on and for just the purpose of everyone in this viewership, um, I work very closely with Alex on tons of prostate and urology stuff. So I didn't have any concerns in that department, I guess, because I still have the affiliation with UCL. Um, but my priority was personal. It was being close to home and being close to my dad and my brothers. That is the main reason why I want to do men's health. And that was my personal. So for me in the camp structure, P was probably the overriding structure. And that that's what really hit at home for me. Though this was my second choice priority. Um, I'm very happy with how it's ended up because I'm now only 10 minutes away from home. And this is exactly that what I wanted because now I have two academic blocks I can potentially have urology and I'm still continuing with my research and Ollie? Oh, yeah I'm gonna go last and I'm just conscious that questions are building up actually now while we've been talking which is which is great um so I am in in a slightly unusual academic unit actually where so the northern deanery is the only deanery that gives you two academic blocks and so that that means you get four months in F one and four months in F two, uh, which is which is a lot. You know that's that's a third of your time in the foundation program. And the reason why I chose that initially was I want to do neurosurgery primarily and wanted to do that at the time. And as everybody knows, that is a specialty that is very competitive and requires lots in the way of output and experience. And I thought, well, naturally, if I have double the time, I should be able to do double the things in theory. And and in practice, that's actually worked, but not in the way that I expected it to, uh, because I, I've ended up working with Professor Vance, as Zach was said, who is a medical education professor, doesn't really have anything to do with neurosurgery. She doesn't want me to be a neurosurgeon. Um is kind of desperate. neither do i just yeah. just yeah, say same just i think nobody does apart from yourself just saying yeah um and so i've ended up doing one project in this area like medical education research and developed loads of new skills and qualitative methods that i wouldn't have had otherwise and this year i'm doing a completely different project in pediatric neuro-oncology which is much more closely aligned with that specialty so um things are flexible things can work out not necessarily in the way that you think but i'll uh I'll, i think we should get to these questions and i'll hand over to to the guy yeah so um we'll answer i'll come back to you ibrahim about that but yeah all about camp and link it back to your sfp that's what i would say um do do a bit of both you lose nothing um Thoughts on pros and cons of programs with a four month academic block versus, you know, a half a day a week or a day every two weeks. Yeah, I think for this, really, it's really up to you. It's what do you want to do during your academic block? Um, uh, do you want to do research? Do you just want to do 
it's loads of locum shifts, it's really up to you, it's flexible, but ultimately it's what do you want to do? So if you want to sit down and contribute to a research project, a clinical trial that's, you know, go, goes on for years, then having one day a week dedicated to contribute to a trial in this example is beneficial. If you only had a four months block to contribute to a clinical trial, you're not going to contribute very much uh, outside of that because clinical work is so tiring. On the other hand, if it's just a straight four months block and you've got a smaller project, maybe it's a systematic review, uh, you were aiming for the Lancet, or you want to do a few small projects, you know, sitting down for four months straight, um, having lots of days to write the manuscripts, get the bulk of the work done in one go is extremely beneficial. That you wouldn't really be able to do one day a week to, you know, screen, write, data um, analyze, you'll kind of lose interest, um, get tired very easily and may not be as efficient really. No, and the, that systematic review idea is going to be taken. Sorry, if you've, if you've sat on it for two years, somebody else has already done it. Yeah, I, I personally really got on well with my four month block because I don't know how you guys are watching this, but I'm definitely one of those people that works at all hours as and when you get a, you get a, like a motivation to, to write and, and actually my supervisor works in exactly that same way. So it's worked really quite well, but it's why you'll, you'll notice that you get professors, consultants and, and academics replying to your emails at like two in the morning. It's because lots of people actually work this way and that stop and start uh, approach works really well for me. But as, as the guys have said, it's a very personal thing. And you have um, to really think about what you want to achieve. Agreed. Um, yeah. Rohan has asked, hi Rohan, has asked, um, apologies if he's missed this earlier, if you're applying to multiple streams, how do you tailor the career goal question? So I can go um, first with this. So my goals are actually quite similar to Ali. It's like I'm talking to my role models right now as my speakers because Ollie is very heavily into medical education research and obviously Alex is very interested in urology research. So in my section, I expanded on how I wanted to be a medical educator, but also an academic urologist. And that's how I pretty much combined the two. And you lose nothing for being truthful, as Ollie said at the beginning. You just have to be honest. There is no harm in you showing that you want to be both an educationalist and also a clinician. Yeah. Um, I think it's bizarre, isn't it, that it's in our job description as doctors that we actually have to be scholars, scientists, educationalists, and actually relatively few are, like, are, are good at, you know, good at any of those things, like, let alone, um, well, most doctors are good doctors, that's not what I mean to say, but given that we are supposed to teach the next generation you know we are given relatively little training on how to do that and the same with with being leaders and um driving the profession forward um i'm just going to come to the next question which is about i've not managed to complete a research project but i've managed to complete quality improvement projects am i at a disadvantage no really absolutely not I, mean, I, I will defer to the guys here but my my advice on that front would be when you're when you're thinking about answering these questions you are not being scored for the content of what you write as in as in what you have actually done you're not really being scored on those things it's about reflecting on what you've done and what you learn from it and what you're going to take forward because remember that like the the white space questions have to factor in a huge range of possible answers some people will have done a systematic review some people will have done a small audit but close the loop some people will have driven some change within their university we're, we're not we're not trying to like define the value of these different things it's about it's it's about your experience and how you how you reflect on it is is what I would say. And I would actually like to chip in and um, 
this is kind of like um, if this was black market advice, I guess um, it could be considered that. But last year, there were people who intentionally checked the boxes. I'm not sure if you guys can do that for all research streams for oh, sorry, all streams. So they ticked all research management, uh, leadership management and education, because then they unlocked more answers and then they got to talk about themselves because if the academic units didn't actually offer leadership and they only offered research, sorry, you have more white space questions that you kind of have to mark because that's more information on you. Uh, but again, I'm not sure if you can do that. But that's just if you can, maybe, maybe sneak that in. Um, then should we, should we take a couple more minutes of questions and then wrap things up? Yeah. Uh, so we've answered that. As most are only at four months, how do you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hit the ground running, Anna, as Alex has already answered. There's nothing stopping you from already, you know, literally, if you get, if you get the post, boom, reach out to your supervisor, get, get, you know, have the things in, uh, rolling in motion. Ali, this is kind of more directed for you. Nelly has asked for Northern. They state that applicants are to complete all white space questions. Hmm. You should indicate your preferred theme in your response. How should I interpret this? Am I still outlining my rationale, or does this mean that the first question outlining your reasons for ap applying effectively provides the rationale? Uh, unless, unless I'm missing something, Nelly, in, in what you're asking, those two things are kind of the same in that the question is, r remember, it's 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 your reasons for applying for the specialized foundation program in the regions that you've chosen to apply right it's what i was saying before it's it's not saying it's not saying describe why you think a candidate would apply in the abstract sense to the specialized foundation program it is why are you applying and it needs to be specific to what you want and uh, as you've said they they encourage you to tick all three, but I think you've you've answered the question really, which is to say, I am applying for the specialized foundation program, and my my preferred theme is you could be as black and white as that. My preferred theme is vascular surgery research or something, um, or research in general because I want X Y Z. This feeds into my long-term career plan to do X, Y, Z. And the specialized foundation program is good for me because X, Y, Z. Like it's, you, you can be pretty black and white about it um, in that sense. Yeah, and I think you just answer it. Um, there's no shame. You can answer it at the beginning like and explain why... Um, you want to do research more, why you want to do med ed more. And for the Northern Deanery, I think it's literally because Prof wants to read all of your answers. That's why she's forcing you to do all of the, you know, tick boxes. That's my impression, because she wants to know more about the potential applicants that she gets to interview. And you only get to do that by making sure all boxes are ticked. Yeah. Um, and what something that I think is really important, it comes back to thinking about how they score these things. Remember that just because you say, I want a track that has vascular surgery in it, and that's why I'm applying for it, and that doesn't mean that you will get a track that has vascular surgery in it. You're going to be ranked against everyone else in the deanery, and you may be offered a job it, that, you know, you might rank 20 jobs and you get your number 20, which you want to be a surgeon, but it has GP, psychiatry, peds, and well, maybe it has two psychiatry blocks. Um, so this is, it comes back to what I was saying again before about your, you're not scored or assigned a job based on the specific things you say. It's being used to generate a number, which is then going to be used to compare your number to lots of other people's numbers. It's uh, you've got to be reduced to a single data point before they can then give you the job. 
So you may as well be honest because they're not going to use the content of your answer to give you that job. Yeah, and um, what's it called? Uh, Pierre has asked for the question about the challenges you oversee working both clinically and academically. Would it be okay to mention you plan on taking locum shifts to ensure you're, you know, you don't de-skill essentially? I mean, I, I like that, but it's more. It makes you sound maybe not mention locum because that makes you sound that could be interpreted as okay, you you want money, which you know, getting like fourteen pounds an hour. Yeah, I agree. It's. But, a gray potentially controversial area to mention that um i think there are other ways to mention that you'd like to maintain your clinical skills can you run clinical skills teaching sessions for medical students can you do bedside teaching can you go on courses uh have you researched your deanery do they fund courses for you to go on atls um, anything like that so there are other ways to do it i'll just pick the best one um and the one that you know works the best i would say yeah Pra practically, I found in my F1 year that the academic block did give me time to locum, like that is a benefit of working academically, because you're not so tired in the evening that you don't want to do anything else. But I, I think I agree with what Alex has just said there is that it, that's a bit of practical wisdom probably to make the most of rather than making it part of your application is probably the best advice. Yeah. And I got a DM from someone, Ollie, um, and it's from Netra. She's asking, uh, how is your med ed uh, in Northern like? What does the four month period entail? Specifically um, for Northern. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, assuming that things haven't changed, there is one med ed job in Northern, which is quite hotly contested. Um, the thing that you have to remember is that it is uh it's med ed research because prof vance who runs the northern sfp is a is a professor of med ed so she's into it, it's medical education research not medical education delivery as in teaching medical students um if you if you want to teach medical students and do simulation and things that you absolutely can. I was able to do that, but I had to organize that myself. That had that had nothing to do with the fact that I was a med ed SFP doctor. Um, my research is in medical education, but be aware that there is a big difference between medical education delivery and medical education research. And they're not the same thing. And some people will be interested in both, but most people probably aren't i think when most people say med ed they think delivery they think teaching um so just before before you apply for it i would just do a bit of reading and make sure you're clear on the difference yeah right yeah alex yeah i think we should probably begin to wrap up here um it's nearly an uh, 9 9 p.m. Um, I think we should maybe end on one piece of advice from Aqua and Ollie. What would be your ultimate one piece of advice if you had to give to everyone? If you're not thinking about it and you came here, you know, to really decide, are you going to go for it or are you not? You should go for it. 100%. You lose nothing. Yeah, agree. I'm, I'm going to sneak in two things, but in one sentence, so it still counts. Uh, which is that everyone should apply for the SFP, whether or not they want it, because it's a free chance to get a really specific job you want. And secondly, if you don't get it, don't worry about it, because it changes nothing about your career, and you will still be able to do all of the same stuff anyway, whether you're an SFP doctor or you're a, a standard foundation doctor. Um it makes no difference. It's just a nice thing to have if you are lucky and can get it. But it, it doesn't make or break anything about your future career. My one line of advice would be the devil's in the detail. Uh, if you're unsure if something's going to count for the portfolio, check the documentation. It's all listed there. Uh, if you're unsure about um, anything, really look into it. And I think the second thing for me would be 
if you don't mention it, it doesn't count. Just because you submit a white space question, don't assume it's your interviewers will read it. The interviewers could be completely separate to whoever's reviewed your white space question. So because you've done an MB PhD, you've mentioned in the white space question, don't assume the interview in front of you knows about it. There's a story about a, a friend I heard uh, a few years back, apparently he's done an MB PhD, put it down in the uh, white space questions, forgot to mention it in the interview. Um, and yeah, the, the exams didn't think anything about it. Um, so don't assume anything and the devil's in the detail. That's what I'd say. He's a, or he or she's a double doctor. Oh, oh, that's rough. That's awful. <laughs> anyway, thank you everybody so much for coming. Um, there'll be one of these a week for the next however many weeks. Um, at same time, same platform, uh, we'll, we'll be advertising every week. Uh, please fill out the feedback form if you haven't done already. It really helps us tune the next one so we can make each one better. Um, and again, if there is anything you'd like to see, please let us know. Leave it in the feedback. And otherwise, we will see you all next week. Thank you, guys. And on demand. Bye, everyone. <laughs> on demand, exactly. Bye. Bye.